Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising. As we convene day five of a five-day program on the situation uh, in Ukraine. Uh, today, I just want to accentuate uh, something that was in the news uh, just a few minutes ago about uh, Russian uh, missile attacks across uh, much of Ukraine that killed apparently 19 uh, people. Uh, this is happening within the context of what we've been discussing over the last couple of days of a stalemate uh, in Ukraine. Ukrainian forces are expected to be launching a counterattack and a, a spring offensive momentarily. There's discussion uh, in various places around the world of the war of attrition that is now uh, grinding on and the utility of uh, further uh, combat in a situation which is only destroying uh, Ukraine and not really moving the borders that have been secured uh, by the Russians essentially over the last year as they uh, consolidated uh, territory in eastern Ukraine and southern Ukraine to secure a land bridge uh, to Crimea. Uh, leaked documents are showing that uh, the Ukrainians are losing soldiers at seven to eight to one uh, uh, with the Russians, so that for every Russian soldier that's being killed, seven or eight Ukrainians uh, are being killed. At the same time, uh, nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons are being deployed in Belarus uh, to match the U.S. Uh, tactical uh, nuclear weapons in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, so we have a situation uh, in Ukraine uh, that is both stable in a certain way, uh, but also escalating uh, in other ways uh, that makes uh, the situation uh, even more dangerous, uh, which is accentuated by uh, escalating tensions with China. And then also at the same time, China has taken uh, an extraordinary initiative uh, without the United States uh, and has been visiting various capitals uh, with a peace initiative. Uh, and uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Volodya Zelensky just talked uh, a few days ago and apparently had very frank uh, discussions. Uh, and so we have in Ukraine, uh, a complexity that includes not only the fog of war, but also the beginnings of a movement uh, toward a recognition uh, that the war needs to end. And so we're very fortunate today to have someone with deep, both diplomatic experience, uh, but also military experience, uh, who will be shedding a light on the situation and the complexities that we're all witnessing uh, in that part of the world, which is now happening within a global uh, context. Before we jump in, let us pause as we always do as we begin our sessions on humanity rising and simply breathe together with escalating turbulence and chaos uh, in our world. Uh, perhaps the most important thing that we can do is, is develop inner coherence and there's no more way that's more effective than simply engaging in conscious, coherence, breathing. So in a moment, for those of you who are new, uh, we'll, you'll hear the sound of a bell. When you hear the bell, just breathe in very slowly. For about five and a half seconds, you'll hear another bell. Just breathe out. We'll take 10 breaths together, and then we'll begin our program. Thank you, everyone. Welcome to Humanity Rising.
Thank you, everyone. Now it's my pleasure uh, to introduce my co-moderator and partner, uh, Jody Evans, the co-founder of Code Pink, which is co-sponsoring this uh, summit on Ukraine. Jody, it's always a pleasure, and I turn the program over to you. Thank you, Jim. And so I don't want to miss a minute to go forward because we have an amazing guest today. But here we are at the end of this extremely informative week. And we have a brilliant, courageous, and deeply thoughtful guest who has had the front row seat into the world of war and the contortions that lead to it. Our guest, Larry Wilkerson, is a retired United States Army Colonel and the former Chief of Staff to Secretary of State Colin Powell. During his time in the US Navy's Pacific Command, he was in South Korea, Japan, and Hawaii. Um, Colonel Wilkerson was responsible for the review of the information from the CIA used to prepare Secretary Powell for his very famous, infamous <laughs> uh, February 2003 presentation to the UN Security Council which was that pivotal moment that Bush needed to go to war on Iraq. After leaving the government, he was a distinguished adjunct professor of government and public policy at the College of William and Mary and taught national security affairs at the George Washington University. He also received the Sam Adams Award for Integrity in Intelligence. Um, Colonel Wilkerson is also a non-resident fellow of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, who's a partner um, with Code Pink in the calling for diplomacy in Ukraine. Uh, Larry shares his wisdom across platforms from students to members of Congress, from the public to those in power needing common sense, uh, something we discussed yesterday. So welcome, Larry, please um, join us. We look forward to this conversation with you. Good to be with you. Thank you. So we've um, talked a lot about this week about the propaganda that takes us to war. And as I just mentioned, you, you were right there in a, in a moment of a seeding of propaganda and you see it daily, um, what, what, how do you see us dealing with that? I mean, it's so hard to get truth and we're so grateful you're with us today, but what have you seen and in the change of propaganda and how hard it is to get through it? I think the American people today have every right to be suspect of almost every mainstream media source that serves them, so to speak. And I say that because I have seen over the last, well, really the last half century, but certainly in the last 20 plus years, the media become almost like William Randolph Hearst, Citizen Kane, his media, uh, when the, the, the media's mantra was, uh, you find some place you want to go to war and I'll sell it for you. Um, and that's what the media has become and nowhere more blatantly and more unilaterally than this Ukraine conflict. It's almost as if they've discovered a war that all of them, from the Washington Post to the New York Times to you name it, love. It's whites, it's Christians, it's European. Now, oh, it's those bloody Russians whom we never liked anyway. Um, it, it is a disaster what's happened with London, even Berlin, uh, other capitals, Paris, Washington leading the way, the warmongering that's going on in the media. Now, it's dissipating and attenuating a bit now because of some of the things you suggested in your opening remarks and others too, um, that things aren't going too well. Uh, and they're going to go downhill from here, especially if Ukraine decides to mount to execute this so-called offensive that's coming up because they are going to lose enormously. And that's sad, really sad. So the media does not serve the American people anymore. And it's very difficult to search on the internet. You can, if you're assiduous and you're diligent, find sources that'll tell you the truth. But it's difficult because there are so many cacophonous and otherwise uh, half correct, a quarter correct 
sources on the Pentagon, uh, on the internet too. Um, and so it's difficult. It's difficult. There's no one speaking truth to power. And frankly, when I go out in the hustings and meet with Americans, they seem to be unusually content with that. That's bad. That's really bad. Yeah, that's bad on all levels. I know I haven't, it, it, the American public feels like they've been rock to sleep. Um, and I think the propaganda is part of that because if you can't find the ground and you can't trust anything, um, it's hard to know what to do. And I, you know, I think it's, they've been on purpose. This has happened. It's not on accident. It's, it's constructed that way. I think you're right. And I, I, I was just out at the Prisker Institute in Chicago which is a very prestigious military museum and group of people who study the American military. And one of the things that came across loud and clear was there's no skin in the game. Mm -hmm. Americans do not have any skin in the game. They don't have any monetary skin in the game because we're just printing money out the, it's incredible what we've done. These wars have been fought on the printing presses. That's what they've been fought on. Um, there's no war tax. No one coming to your door and saying thousand dollars, this week, $1,000 next week in order to finance these wars. Thank you very much. How long do you think these wars would last if, if that were the case? And only 1% of the American youth are serving. So the major amount, the people who graduate from Princeton and Dartmouth and Harvard and are NFL linebackers and such, they don't have to worry. They don't have to go to a combat zone. So there's no skin in the game. That's part of it. So yes, it's it's it, and even this last war was sold kind of like a comic book. You know, it's like there's Superman, Zelensky, and then there's the evil you know monster Putin, and it's a comic book. And you know, and behind that, behind that evil man Vladimir Putin is that yellow man Xi Jinping. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's like a comic book series. And I liken the media these days to comics. Yes, it, yeah, it's so simplified and dumbing down um, definitely the, the American people. You, you talked about no skin in the game. Um, the recent um, Pentagon report that only 77, oh no, 77% of U.S. citizens 18 to 24 are ineligible to serve in the military. That's correct. Um they're either intellectually ineligible or they're obese. Um, the military is so desperate right now. The army, for example, was 15,000 recruits short last year. Um, so desperate right now that they have started a program at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and an adjunct at Fort Benning, Georgia, to get people thin, to bring people in who otherwise would not be able to be recruited because they're too obese, and to thin them down. Little t attention are they paying to the medical community saying, you know what recidivism is like amongst people like this? Once you get them thin, they'll go back 90% of them will go back to being obese again. And then what have you done? You put the problem on the platoon leader in the service in the combat zone. And then the other thing they're doing is creating another McNamara's 100,000. That was Defense Secretary Robert McNamara's bringing in of less than eligible intellectually people and educating them and trying to send them to war. And they went to Vietnam and a professor has just done a really stunning book on this and showed what happened to them. Um, they either got other people killed or themselves killed or both, or they performed uh, abjectly in the combat zone. And we're doing it again. We're educating people at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. What we're really doing is teaching them the test. And that's a crime. I mean, that's a crime against humanity. Yes. Um, yes. So um, going back to the media and, you know, I'm, I'm curious because you're someone who everyone looks to because you are inside of it. You're, you're, you're studying this. It's, you know, constantly. Are you on the media as much as you used to be? No, I've, I've refused now to do mainstream media. I've stopped it entirely. I do do State Department's al Hura, the truth that they're broadcast into the Arabic world. And let me tell you something that happened to me recently there. The occasion was the 20th anniversary. I hate that term uh, with regard to the invasion of Iraq. Right. And of course, it's supposed to be a happy term. 
but that was the occasion and people were on before me and they were talking about this, that, and the other thing, all positive about Iraq. And I came on and the, the Lebanese uh, interviewer in Arabic asked me, translated in my ears, he said, what do you, what's your view of Iraq? I said, total disaster. I thought he was going to fall off his chair. Then he started asking me more questions and I started telling, telling him why it's a total disaster and why the Middle East is a total disaster because of what we did, the forces we unleashed. And after it was over, 20 minute interview, I get up to leave and he walks over, takes his earphones off, walks over and shakes my hand and says, thank you for telling the truth. <laughs> Whoa, yes. <laughs> al -hura, Arabic for the truth. Yes. Well, so let's talk about some truth um, that Cy Hirsch is trying to spread around who blew up Nord Stream. Um, what, what's happening in Washington around that? that they've been able to just silence the story. Um, they wanted to. They wanted to. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if the immediate story that came out about the Ukrainian commandos and the rowboat, <laughs> that that wasn't fabricated by our own intelligence community. Didn't work very well, and it was a lousy, lousy fabrication. But there are other stories that have been put out there to counter that, too, that are more sophisticated. Um, when you look at it, you, you, you know there are only two or three countries with the capacity to pull off something like that. One of them is the United States, one of them is Russia, one of them is China. There might be one other out there somewhere, but I don't know about them if they exist. But I do know about the U.S. capability because I was, uh, shall we say, in, involved in a top secret working group when I was at state that looked at their capabilities and looked at what they might be able to do for us in another scenario. So I knew they were there. I had even postulated a week before that they might be used if someone wanted to do that. And for the life of me, I can't think of a reason that anyone else would have done it other than the United States. So I have to conclude on those two parameters that, yeah, we did it. And we'll never confess, of course. And the stunning thing to me, if that is the case, is one, did we tell the Chancellor of Germany, the most important country in Europe other than Russia? And second, if we did, how the heck did he convince himself to go along with it? Because right now, I've talked to members of the Bundestag, right now, the energy the Germans are getting, the, the natural gas they're getting is dirty, much dirtier than Nord Stream was providing. One Bundestag member told me about nine to 10 times dirtier. And it's somewhere between five and nine times more expensive. It's coming mainly from the Permian Basin in Texas, fracking, uh, and that makes it dirty. So, so I'm asking myself, how long is this going to last? How long is this going to last? If they have a really tough winter next year, they were lucky this year, they had a mild winter. Um, if, if things really turn sour on the German economy, we're also trying to wean them off China. How do you wean some off their major trade partner? This deal we just did with Australia, we are essentially telling Australians, you know, do this deal with us and ignore, or even worse, your major trade partner, China. This is preposterous, and yet this is what we're doing. This is what empires in decline, precipitous decline, do. But why Why do people go along? What? What? It's obvious that it's in decline. <laughs> what? allows Germany and Australia leadership to get away with doing this because, you know, it's, it's like they're climbing onto the Titanic. That's a very good metaphor. They do not see any other power in the world as being as comfortable as their relationship with Washington has been since 1945. Colin Powell turned to me when I first joined him, Lieutenant Colonel, I wasn't about to say too much to him, 1989, and he says, Larry, you know, the whole situation in Europe is going to change. Francois Mitterrand, Helmut Kohl, John Major, Maggie Thatcher, all these people are going away. Their feet were in the war. When they are no longer there, when there's no one there that remembers that American cemetery, cemetery at Normandy who remembers those GIs that waded ashore to liberate France. We're in trouble. Well, I think we're in trouble, but we're not there quite yet because there's still this lingering sensation that whom do I fly to if I leave Washington? I've been such a 
a disciple, such an apostle of Washington for so long. I can't go to Moscow. I can't go to Beijing. I can't go to Tokyo. My God, that country's disappearing. Their demographics are horrible. Um, where do I go? And then they say, well, I have no choice. And they stay with Washington. My comment to them when they'll listen is you need, you got 740 million people in the EU now. You have a GDP, the equivalent of ours, 22, $23 trillion. You need to grow up. You need your own security identity. You need to just do away with NATO. You need to be a power in your own accord. Of course, they can't get their political act together. But but I think they were close to it. I think that the Ukraine war has a lot to do with how close the EU was getting to Russia yeah. and how disturbing that was for the United States. I, I clearly think that the, you know, Blinken and those folks saw that the EU was um, becoming a friend of Russia and it was a, a Euro-Russia relationship building and that freaked them freaked them out. And that's why, I, I mean, I don't understand, you know, how they're getting away with the devastation to economies in Europe that this war is. That, um, that's, that's a good question. It's a good point. Um, I still think the European security identity that we were trying to build in 1993 and 94, for example, it would have been a separate brigade that would have been apart from NATO. It could operate on its own. It wouldn't detract from NATO. They wouldn't do that. They wouldn't go along with that. And I saw us actually indirectly trying to undermine it too, because we didn't really want it to happen. Right. Um, as I said, they're too accustomed to what they've become accustomed to over the last decades. Once that goes away, once that feeling goes away, the transatlantic link is broken, the alliance will be done away with fairly soon. I think it's going to happen really fast, really. Yeah. Right. He engineered, to a certain extent, Jan Stoltenberg, the director general of NATO, secretary general of NATO. We engineered, to a certain extent, the elections in Norway, Finland, Sweden. We got our people into position. I'm convinced that it's less than 50% of all of those new members of NATO, Finland included, the most dramatic new member, that really wanted this to happen. But they, they had governments that were able to engineer it and it happened. We had a hand in that. And you're right. I think part of, I call them winking, blinking, nod, and nudge, <laughs> referring to Biden, Blinken, Sullivan, and Victoria Newland always standing in the wings, waiting aspirant Secretary of State. Um, they are trying to reestablish U.S. hegemony, ironclad over Europe, particularly Germany. Uh, and and the fact that the Europeans can't see that, or apparently, if they do see it and understand it, are frightened of going elsewhere, frightened of their own shadow, because they don't see that they can get their political act together and form a body that's formidable and able to compete with Washington and with Moscow. Maybe Moscow should be a part of this. By the way, that was our intention in 1991 and two under George H.W. Bush. We were going to offer them NATO membership even. Yeah, uh, which would have been great. That would have been peace, but God forbid we have peace on the planet. And, and the greatest diplomatic failure in the history of the planet is going to be recorded if there are historians alive to record it. We were actually dismantling 75,000 nuclear warheads. We got down to about five or 6,000 on each side, Russia and US mainly. But we were doing that hell bent for leather. We were just dismantling it. And now we've stopped and we're starting to build again. That's gonna be the greatest diplomatic failure in probably human history, particularly if we have a nuclear war. Well, let's talk about nuclear war because, you know, when I started to see the war building from the United States towards China about over three years ago, the first thought I had is like, really, do they think they can win a nuclear war? Like, they, why would they do this unless they have some concept that they could win a nuclear war? Because they lose every war. <laughs> what China? Like China, billion, 400,000 people? Um, no. I've been asking myself the same question and other people the same question. My students the question. I've had some really bright students, really bright students. They taught me more about the George W. Bush administration than I knew from my personal experience, for example, over 16 years. Um, 
I actually think there are people who do not understand what they're doing. Lots of them. And so their entire approach is first their own personal ambition for power, money, you name it. Set, don't ever discount the lure of filthy lucre. That's what we're based on today is filthy lucre. Predatory capitalism that is just running rampant all over the globe. And it's created the greatest maldistribution of wealth probably in human history. That's no under, that's no overstatement. I might have understated it. Um, if you know anything about Thomas Piketty, you know what his writings are on the basis of how we construct inequality regimes in the world. Well, we have the greatest inequality regime in the world right now, engineered principally by us in China. That's not going to last very long if something isn't done to attenuate it and ameliorate it. But that's just the fundamental layer cake, if you will. What's on top of that is a bunch of people who are probably the worst leaders the world has ever seen in terms of comprehending what it means to look out for your, uh, your generations in the future, to understand what it means to protect your country in a real viable sense, who understand what it, what it means to make the non-proliferation treaty, for example, a real treaty where you're actually reducing the number of nuclear weapons on the planet, not increasing them, enhancing them, and so forth. This leadership is ignorant. We have not elected anybody in this country as a congressman or a congresswoman or a member of the executive branch with formidable power in a long time who has any grasp of what I've just described a look at the future, a realization of what humanity is facing. Uh, look at the climate crisis. You know, uh, yesterday I was on a webinar with a member of NOAA who is one of the president's team for dealing with the climate crisis. And she laid out a staggering statistic for us that in the past 20 years, a billion dollar disaster has occurred in America about every 82 days. But in the past five or six years of that 80, of that, uh, 20 years, it's increased now to a billion dollar disaster every 18 days. And I wanted to ask the question, what will it be in another five years? Because it's just going to be worse. We need leadership that sees the real crises in the world and goes after them with a vengeance. We have a leadership that's still operating on, I need to make money. I need to be president. I need to win a second term. I need to win my seat in the Congress and become a millionaire. I need to win my seat in the Senate and certainly become a millionaire. I need to then be a lobbyist on K Street and make millions more. These are the motivations our people have. They are very unethical, low-brained people. And we put them in office. And we're going to pay for it. We're going to pay for it dearly. Well, I mean, we also have the lie that we live in a democracy and then we suck everybody's brains, hearts and money into a charade of elections that drains all the energy that should be spent, you know, calling for the needs of the people instead sucked into some structure that's just a bunch of, you know, guns for hire that will take your money and who knows what's going to happen. It's not democracy because you can have a democracy without and journalism and without uh, equality. And and money. Democracy with it's a capitalist democracy without what you said. You must have an informed and informing media. You must have labor unions and a viable workers' movement that checks the predatory capitalists. And you've got to have, as Jefferson said so eloquently, an informed public. If you don't, you're done. You're toast. You cannot have a democracy without those three ingredients, especially one that's based on capitalism. Yes. And um, you were talking about climate change. And so we've seen, you know, the studies have been done that show that war and militarism are the greatest contributor to climate change. The numbers are so great that basically you can say the sentence, it doesn't matter what else you do if you don't end war, we're going over the edge. And you have Biden talking about climate change and having this office you discuss, but driving war, sending more weapons and not sitting at a diplomacy table. Um, how, you know, what, 
that's another example of not caring about a future. Ukraine, and, Ukraine is an exemplar for everything you and I've just said. Uh, sad to say, because people are dying and dying at a, uh, quite an exorbitant rate. Although I will say in Africa and Yemen, they're dying at an even faster rate. We don't seem to be interested about these Arabs yeah. and these black people who are dying. Um, in Sudan, the situation is terrible. Um, we, we have a situation, I think, where Americans have been sold this war, but are beginning almost perceptibly now, I think, and I'm going to go out west here next week and feel around out there a bit, to understand that they're being ill-served by the media and that this war is not what it's being billed to be. Um, if we go ahead the way we're headed right now with this stalemate and the Ukrainians launch their offensive, and they get butchered the way I suspect they're going to, because the Russians are in echelon defense now. And anybody who knows Karl von Clausewitz in his book, Vom Krieg on war, you know, that's the strongest form of warfare. So do the Russians. They're very good at this kind of warfare. So they've quit this, you know, massive attacks and all that kind of, they're just going to attrit the Ukrainians at every echelon of that defense until there's none left. Then we're going to be at a point where Putin is in the high chair, as it were, going to negotiations. That would probably be a disaster for Ukraine because that means you've got to give more and more on your side. We need to stop right now. And the design is there right now. You can see all the points. I pointed them out the other day to a member of Congress. All the points that we need to negotiate, and you can see all the positions. The problems are becoming acute in both countries and I mean Washington and Moscow, domestic political situation. Because Putin is in a situation now where if he gives anything that back in Moscow is seen as a major concession, he may be replaced by people worse than he. And that means probably nuclear weapons use. On the other hand, Biden has hoisted himself on his own political petard too, because he's declared again, and he's going to run again, and he can't be seen as backing away from this conflict in a significant way too soon because he'll get blamed for it too. Think LBJ in Vietnam and putting a half million troops in Vietnam when LBJ said, quote, oh, ho, ain't going to be moved by no more bombs. That's what he said. He knew he couldn't win that war, but he put a half million troops in there and we had 30,000 more casualties. Domestic politics is bad on both sides, but we need some courage. We need some courage on Putin's part and some courage on Biden's part to end this conflict. Because as you pointed out, and as your event here is tailored towards, I think, we're headed for nuclear war. And that is everyone's Pyrrhic victory, if you will, that isn't even Pyrrhic. It's going to be a disaster. Well, you mentioned you have some points for diplomacy because we, we're also, I mean, you know, with Quincy and Code Pink and many other partners have been trying to talk about diplomacy and um, Medea disrupt, well, not even disrupted, Medea went up really respectfully to Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi the other night and said, you know, Congresswoman, we really need diplomacy. We need peace. And she said, no, we don't need that. We need victory. And you and I, that's the same thing as sending 500,000 people to die. And what's Nancy Pelosi's skin in the game? What's None. Feinstein's skin in the game? What's Chuck Schumer's skin in the game? What's Mitch McConnell's skin in the game? Zero. None. They should leave the Congress immediately as being too old to think. <laughs> they have no skin in the game. They well, don't have sons and daughters in the military that's going to die out there. They don't. They have no skin in the game. The Democrats have been feckless in not bringing up anyone. Look at we got a president who's going to be eighty plus. They have not nurtured anyone to be competitive, and that's Feinstein and Pelosi and Schumer. That's their fault. Well, they're narcissists, so we we know that, and Bingo. they don't. Bingo. Yeah. Well, but, you know, the points of diplomacy that you shared with Congress, I would love to hear what you shared. I thought I, I think it's really fairly simple. The first the going in 
position of the United States is Ukraine will never repeat, never be a member of NATO. Second, we recognize your sovereignty over Crimea. Done deal. It's yours. Ukraine has the port of Odessa, which is actually better than Sevastopol. So what the heck is the argument for in terms of access to the sea? Um, the second point is to Mr. Putin, if we're going to recognize your sovereignty over Crimea, and by the way, 60 or 70 percent of the people in Crimea want that, um, you need to recognize Kosovo. I don't know if you've seen that article in the National Geographic that just came out. It's a great article. It describes the situation in Kosovo. It tells you how those women, mostly, are trying to resurrect that basically Albanian country and how the Serbs, with Russia's backing, are keeping the country split apart at the new bridge. You can't hardly cross the new bridge to the north if you're Albanian, a Kosovar. You can't hardly cross it if you're a Serb to the south. It's really a tenuous situation, and Russia's exacerbating it, and they've never recognized Kosovo as an independent state. So that's what you have to do, Mr. Putin. And then you go on down and you say, we need a stalemate. We need a stalemate. We got a stalemate. Let's have a ceasefire, a ceasefire. And then you put in UN forces or OSCE forces or something to manage that ceasefire. And maybe you need a demilitarized zone. Maybe you need a 15, wide, uh, 15 kilometer wide or maybe even a 30 kilometer wide. And then you need referenda in the, in the uh, Eastern Oblast. And if more than 60% say, I want neutrality, Fine. You don't go to Kiev. You don't go to Moscow. If they say they want affiliation with Moscow, you try that. If you if they say they want affiliation with Kiev, you try that and you get the people to buy that. Then you move on through that process. Diplomacy in this situation and most situations is not about win win. It's about lose lose. You each lose a little, uh, but it's not too much to break your position. Uh, and you got to do that because your domestic audiences are not going to uh, support what you do unless you do. I think the recipe is there. Here's the problem. As I said, you got to have a lot more casualties and a lot more uh, stalemate before you can. That's what Richard Haas, my old boss, and Charlie Kupchin in their article in Foreign Affairs said the other day, and I was appalled by it. You know, I know Richard's probably politicking for a position in the Biden administration, but, you know, uh, they essentially said, we got to kill a few more people and go a few more years in this stalemate before we can sit down and talk, because then everybody would be tired enough to talk. Are you kidding me? That's horrific. Is that the best you can do? <laughs> but but they knew that when they were already at the table and decided to go to war. I mean, whenever because that's a decision on all sides. Yes, yes. So and, and, that war could only happen with the United States, Zelensky and, you know, Putin kind of like, OK, we're, we're I mean, kind of probably the U.S. and Zelensky, um, because otherwise you stay at the table because you understand people are going to die, but they don't care who's going to die. No. And the fact that, you know, this climate change and what you've described, because you described it as a billion dollar disasters, but people die. And one of those disasters was Buffalo this winter. Yep. Um, the freezing over Buffalo, where people died because guess what? The infrastructure isn't there anymore. No one's coming to save you. Wait until this water that's building up at the high altitudes in Southern California and elsewhere it pours down once it gets loose. Uh, the flooding there is going to be. I have friends in Los Angeles who tell me that their electric bills last year were $1,800 to $2,000 a month, and they still had brownouts and blackouts. Yeah. Um, and, and they had multiple back to back 100 plus degree days. Um, this is coming. It's here in the global south. It's here big time. There are people who already can't farm because it's too dry or in some cases there are floods um, in the southern part of Iraq, for example, where Saddam Hussein tried for years to get rid of the Marsh Arabs. They're gone virtually because the Tigris and Euphrates is a trickle down around Basra. Um, mm. It's happening. Mm. And guess what? The billion or so people in the global South hate our guts because they see us as the big doer in all of this catastrophe and not doing anything about it. Well, so I'm going to ask one more question. Let Jim ask some questions. I'm sorry. I'm so greedy, Jim. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, well, so, you know, we talked about the EU coming together and creating a, a, an alternative power structure, but what we are seeing with Ukraine 
is the global south going, if you can sanction Russia for, do, for doing less than what you do every day and call it a rules-based order, we're all screwed. So yeah. we're just going to dash. Thanks very much. We are going to leave you. And we just saw Dilma being inaugurated as the head of the BRICS Bank last week. And we are seeing BRICS stronger than ever and growing. Indonesia got, you know, joining, Pakistan growing, the Middle East joining. The BRICS could represent five, five billion people when it's done coming together. It's a, you know, I keep telling people, look, the United States has made enemies of one third of the world. Um, if you go to OFAC, the Office of Financial Assets Control, you'll find out they officially say we have 32 co countries under massive sanctions. It's much higher than that, actually. And the indirect sanctions probably impact two to three billion people in the world. They all hate our guts. I don't blame them. Uh, we couldn't even get humanitarian supplies into the victims of the earthquake in Syria because so many people were scared of our banking sanctions. Um, that's what we've done. We've made lots of enemies in the world. It takes me back to Dick Cheney when he said, I don't want to be loved. I want to be respected and feared, <clears throat> mostly feared. Well, that's what we've done. Uh, that's Rome. That's Rome towards the end of its empire. <clears throat> oh, by the way, you know what Rome did towards the end of its empire? Instead of having citizen soldiers, which was always the bulwark of Rome, they hired people. They had mercenaries. <laughs> what are we doing but that today? Um, you're right. The rest of the world is going to gang up, balance us, and do away with us or make our, li our lives really difficult. Oh, I look at it when the empire's over, we could just become Italians, which are pretty cool. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I try to look at it with an optimistic view. It's like, oh, Rome, Pratt, you know, the empires die. And, you know, look at those Italians. They're happy and cool. Well, we need it. We, we... <laughs> I don't believe in us dying. We're 3,000 miles across, two benign neighbors, two big oceans, 340 million people, uh, 200 million of whom we've put on the earth since World War II, if you can believe that. Um, but we need to get our act together and we need to be a beneficial for the world power rather than a detriment to the world power. Well, but I think what it'll do, it'll, it'll let go of trying to be the, the king of the world and take all that energy back to caring for the people of the United States. That would be a beautiful thing to have happen. And that would have repercussions all across the globe. Would, they would be beautiful too. Yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> so much good we could do. If you, if you just took the $2 trillion that we've wasted on these wars in the last 20 years, you could fix mm -hmm. about half of the problems that we have and a good portion of the problems the rest of the world had. We wasted that money. But it's actually $20 trillion. We uh, At IPS, we did an audit of all, yeah, it's 22. I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. I'm, so, I'm looking at DOD's figures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, it's like all the expenses and all the contractors. And yeah, it's $20 trillion. We could have fixed everything. So may, may we you know lose the empire soon and be able to really nourish the country that needs its uh, our attention. Jim, no, sorry. Questions from you. The only <laughs> argument I would make is that someone else needs to manage that fix because we proved in Afghanistan we can't even do that. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, you're astonishing. I, I'm I'm loving this conversation, and you know I would love to just kind of back up uh, a little bit because I think um, people would be very interested in our global community. You know, what was your pathway? You know, you were in the military, you were in the State Department, you had diverse experience, you were at, you were at very high levels. Um, tell us about how you kind of woke up to the reality. You know, we've had a number of people on, like Daniel Ellsberg and, and others who were very highly placed, uh, and they went through a process of, of self-awareness so finally, they realized the, the truth of what was going on, and they began to act on it uh, in, in various ways. And your clarity is astonishing for someone uh, with uh, that depth of military and, and diplomatic experience. So 
take a few minutes and just tell us a little bit about your your background and and uh, how you came as aware as you've become because that's pretty rare as you pointed out early most people just go along to get along and they're careerists or they want money and and they they don't speak out but you've 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 taken a different path tell us about that path i think i was very slow learner <laughs> i mean i used to tell my wife you know I really am one of the slowest learners I've ever known. I started out in Vietnam with uh, some real, real reservations about what we did in Vietnam. Indeed, about what I saw all around me in Vietnam. But then I turned myself inward uh, as a military professional and tried to do the best I could in that respect. But as I mounted the, the pinnacle, if you will, and that started with my working for Admiral Crow in the Navy uh, in the U U.S. Pacific Command, Admiral Crow being the chairman before Powell, and then got drafted into Powell service and worked for him. And then uh, 12 years of that and ending in the State Department where I had come to think of Colin Powell as the reincarnation of Dwight David Eisenhower. Mm. Uh, Black Eisenhower was the way <laughs> I had him. And I saw what the rest of the U.S. establishment did to Colin Powell. Up close and personal, I saw it. I saw it. What it, I saw what it did to his character. I saw what it did to his spirit. I saw what it did to the man. And mm -hmm. I said, when I left there, and I was tortured for about six or seven months before, I, in October of two thousand and five, I began speaking out about what to do about it. Should I write a book? Should I do this? I said, no. You need to talk to the American people and try to get their attention and to use your experience. And I had lots of students helping me on two different university campuses doing case studies on the war and uncovering things I didn't even know about. Um, and at the end of all of that, I realized that Marine General Smedley Butler was right when he told the Congress, I've been a criminal on two continents for capitalism. No more truer words ever flowed from a military professional's mouth Two medals of honor, the only uh, person in American history to have two medals of honor, a uh, general too. He said, I've been a criminal on two continents. Al Capone hasn't a candle to me, he said. He had a state or two. I had two continents. I raped and pillaged and plundered with my Marines for a capitalism on two continents. He said this to the Congress of the United States. Very wow. smart man, but he was a slow learner too. He spent time in China, time in the Caribbean, all over the world, really, for capitalism, as he put it. And he realized that's what he was. He was a criminal for capitalism. And that's what I realized. Well, uh, tell us uh, as much as you can. I know probably there's, there's uh, various strands that even today aren't publicly uh, uh, accessible, but I'd love to have you, since you were so close to Colin Powell, tell us the, is the story of that UN speech and the events surrounding it, leading up to it, because I think that was one of the most extraordinary moments in, in modern American history, where someone of his integrity and stature lied to the global public, justifying a war that ended up being completely indefensible. It must have taken a huge toll on him. And yet he did the act. And you were there right in the inside of the inside. Could you just tell us the story? I did an interview with Meghna Chakrabarty, um, PBS, WB, WBTV, I guess, Boston, PBS Boston, NPR Boston. Um, and I, it was, a, it was very close to his death. And I was, I was really hoping that it would get out all across the country and explain to people. It's very difficult. Uh, I have a thousand page manuscript in which I deal with it. It's very difficult to explain to Americans, especially white Americans, what it means to be the number one man in the military of the United States of America and to be black. 
It's very mm -hmm. difficult to, they, they have no conception. I have no conception, but I have a better one than they do because I served the man for 16 years. Um, he taught me more about the black American experience than any book ever could. So did his wife, Alma. Um, they had very different views. You know, Alma would say things like, we were better off when we were segregated because we had our churches, we had our families, we had our schools, everything was working, everything was beneficial to us, to hell with the fact that we were economic slaves. We were unto ourselves good people. Now look at us, what's happened to us, scattered mm. all across the spectrum of America on drugs, committing suicide, criminals, and so forth. Um, that's totally opposite of the way he felt. He felt because the military had given him every possibility and judged him not by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character and professionalism, he felt a deep loyalty to it and would not tolerate anyone saying, you got there through affirmative action, you know. Um, probably no better case actually existed in the military of someone who got there on his own competence. That was part of him. And no white American can understand that. No white American, not me, can understand that. But I tried to explain it in both written narrative and to Magna on that interview. The second point is the Bush family had been very, very loyal to him particularly Barbara, who really ran the Bush dynasty, um, H.W.'s wife, Barbara Bush, and he felt a certain loyalty to the Bush family. That loyalty was tattered and eroded majorly when at the end of the day, Brent Scowcroft came to Washington because President Bush wouldn't do it, George H.W. George Bush wouldn't do it, and carried H.W., the father's message to the Oval Office telling his son he was making a mistake to go to war in Iraq. He wouldn't listen. He wouldn't listen. Why wouldn't he listen now? Principally because Karl Rove was telling him, his political advisor, you won't get reelected and beat your father, which is your number one political objective, unless you have a war. Think about domestic politics influencing national security decision making again. It is the most potent force in America. So here you got a president who's so inexperienced, so naive that he thinks that you know, this is the case. I will only get reelected if I have a war. And by the way, a war went pretty good for daddy. So a war with Iraq went pretty good for daddy. So why don't I have a war with Iraq? People say that can't be the reason. Oh, all contraire. It can be the reason. And there were <laughs> a lot of other people playing on their own reasons, like Israel, like people who wanted oil, cheap oil for Israel story, which hasn't even come out yet, but it's going to come out in about a month with a book called Deadly Betray Betrayal. Um, Mark Rich is featured in it. Mark Rich, who Bill Clinton pardoned in the last ignominious hour of his presidency. He was convicted of breaking sanctions in Iraq and selling oil to Israel at discounted prices. Bibi Netanyahu was finance minister at the time. Why has Israel's economic success been so great? Discounted oil now coming from the Kurds in northern Iraq. Big story there, too, on the influences on why we had the war. But Powell is wrapped up in all of this with these distinct types of loyalty that he has. And he is then despicably served by the bureaucracy. George Tennant and John McLaughlin lied to him in my presence about the intelligence he was presenting. He had, on the other hand, Hans Blix coming into his office and telling him, you know, you put the inspectors back on the ground in Iraq, and I will give you with 95% assuredness whether or not they're a WMD. And Powell bought that. And we went to the UN and got UN Resolution 1441 on November the 8th, 2002, which said the inspectors are going back. And the vice president, without checking with anyone, even his president, marched out and gave a speech saying it would make no difference that Saddam would fool them and lie to them. Just discounting everything Powell had done. So then you come to January and we're trying to figure out if we're going to war or not. We couldn't get Blair a second resolution. So Blair thought he was going to lose the vote in his own heavy, heavy labor majority parliament. We couldn't get it because Russia and France threatened to veto and we knew they would. And so here's Powell in this situation asked to go up and sell the war in New York. He has two choices. He can quit and walk out the door and I can go with him because that was a condition of my becoming his chief of staff. 
or he can stay and see if he can handle the situation to the point where war is not the ultimate outcome. Diplomacy is. But he lost. He lost that battle. And I, I think he was being honest when he said that was the lowest point uh, in my career. He deserved a better president. He certainly deserved a better vice president. But I understand the loyalty factor. And I understand that he was looking at intelligence. I'll just give you one example. The third day out at Langley, the CIA headquarters, he essentially grabbed me by the shirt, jerked me into a room and sat me down in a chair. Now, he had never physically accosted me before in our whole time together. So I knew something was badly wrong. He closed the door and he said, we're alone in here, right? And I said, well, boss, it is the CIA. He didn't even crack a smile. I don't like Saddam Hussein's connection with 9-11, Al-Qaeda, and terrorism in general, which I'm presenting in my remarks. I think he thought I was going to object. I said, let's take it out. He looked at me with surprise and said, okay, let's do it now. I went right to Lynn Davidson, the speechwriter who was putting together the presentation. I said, Lynn, take all that crap out. It's garbage. It's about a third of the presentation. And more importantly, it was the most powerful thing for the American people that Saddam had some connections to 9-11. Take it out. We took it out. 30 minutes later, I, big mistake by me, I didn't see the deputy director, John McLaughlin, now a highly paid consultant for CNN. I didn't see him leaning against the door. He disappeared. We go back to resume a rehearsal that's sort of rudimentary at that point in the DCI conference room. And Tenant gets up and leaves. Well, I was angry immediately because I had told him the secretary's orders were, don't ever leave when I'm here practicing. He did. He left. So I'm about to go get him. All of a sudden, he comes back in. He sits down beside the secretary. I'm on the secretary's left. Condi Rice is over here. Rich Armitage is over here. Steve Hadley's over here. Tenant is on his right. Tenant leans into the secretary. And I'm right there, so I hear it all. And he says, Mr. Secretary, we have just learned from interrogation of a high-level al-Qaeda operative about the training by the Mukhabarat, the Iraqi secret police, of al-Qaeda operatives in the use of chemical and biological weapons. Tenet was as serious as a judge. Powell turned to me and said, LW, put it all back in. I put it back in. Later at the Waldorf Astoria in my hotel room, 2 a.m. in the morning, before the morning of presentation on the UN Security Council floor at 9 a.m., I'm taking stuff out still. And I'm taking that kind of stuff out at an alarming rate. I don't know how he found out. Again, it's the CIA. Phil Mudd, the counterterrorism czar at the CIA, appears in my hotel room, walks up behind me, sees me at the computer, and he says, I understand you're taking stuff out of the presentation. I said, yes, you're right. It's too long. I'm taking stuff out. Pal had had a dress rehearsal that night, and he had said it was too long. So I'm taking stuff out, and I knew damn well what I was going to take out. Um, he says, well, you can't do that. I said, watch me. He frustrated, left the hotel room. Next morning on the floor of the uh, UN Security Council, about 30 minutes before Powell was to start, Tenant comes up, puts his arm around my shoulder and says, I understand last night you were taking stuff out of the presentation, stuff on terrorism. I said, Mr. DCI, you're absolutely correct. I was. And he smiled and he said, well, it won't matter anyway. Took his seat because one of the things Powell had told him, unprecedented, Powell had told him, you're going to be behind me on camera. And he was. You don't put the director of central intelligence on camera, not publicly. And Powell put him there because he wanted him taking as much responsibility for the presentation as Powell was. Went ahead. And the most powerful moment in that to me for the American people was when he said, not in this post 9-11 age, you know, these connections of Saddam Hussein with Al Qaeda. That was resonating with Americans. You know, that was powerful with Americans. They associated him with 9-11. And Tony Blair preposterous lie. Tony Blair actually put out, you may recall, that Saddam Hussein could put weapons of mass destruction uh, on London in 45 minutes or so. I mean, he had no capability whatsoever to do that. But this is Blair's way of getting the vote in the parliament that he wanted. 
liars, cheats, and scandal mongers all around. And they served the Secretary of State very despicably, very illly, um, un-American in my view. Uh, and he paid the price for it. I asked people as we were getting ready, I said, why? I wanted them to answer the question themselves, people on my team, including the people from the vice president's office, John Hanna and uh, Will Toby from the NSC staff, both neoconservative assholes in my view. Um, I said, why do you think Powell's going? Uh, well, before you answer, let me, let me just remind you that Adlai Stevenson, the UN ambassador mm. for the United States, gave a much more formidable pre presentation in a much more dangerous moment on the Cuban missiles mm -hmm. in October 1962. Why do you think Powell's going? And one of my team, Barry Lohenkron, who uh, was at state at that time, he'd been at CIA, but he was at state at that time. He said, because he's the only one who has ratings like Mother Teresa with the American people. Yeah. Bingo. He's going up there to fall on his sword for this despicable administration. The Deputy Secretary of State, Richard Armitage, would, in my presence, call the vice president's office the Gestapo, the Nazis. Well, let's talk about that for a second, because it's the neocons, you know, the Dick Cheney's and the Richard Pearls and the Paul Wolfowitzes of the world that that really came into power at that crucial moment, uh, you know, uh, with the uh, the Bush admin, both Bush administrations, but at the at the time when Gorbachev and Bush Senior were wanting, I think there was an impulse to really go to a, the level of statesmanship and and uh, move beyond the Cold War. The neocons seemed to exercise a strategy that essentially took over the American governmental system in terms of foreign policy, uh, administration policy, till finally today you have, you know, the uh, cabal that you spoke about earlier uh, between uh, Blinken, Sullivan, uh, Victoria Nuland, uh, Joe Biden. Talk a little bit about uh, the 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 neocons and the, the extraordinary success that they've had in essentially capturing uh, the U.S. government of uh, foreign and national security policy. My students gave me great insight into this. <laughs> you know, I, I really had some brilliant young men and women at Women Mary in particular, but also in the honors program at George Washington. And their case studies would go something like this when we get to these points. Um, H.W. Bush took the national security strategy that George W. Bush, his son, accepted in 2002. H.W. Bush took it in 1991 and wrote on it, send this back to the crazies in the basement of the Pentagon. That was a skilled, experienced president, the last one we've had. He knew He'd been vice president for Ronald Reagan for eight years. He'd been head of the RNC. He'd been ambassador to China. This was a guy who'd been around the block. He knew that he'd been a, a what, an 18-year-old pilot in the Pacific War in World War II. He knew these people were crazy. And it was Paul Wolfowitz whom he was talking to in terms of sending it back to the crazies in the basement of the Pentagon. His son was a neophyte. He had no experience whatsoever, and yet he had the most experienced bureaucratic entrepreneur, as Richard Haas called him, in the vice presidency. Yeah. So that guy, Dick Cheney, took over the presidency for national security decision making and most foreign policy from the get go. And Bush did not push him back into the closet until he fired Donald Rumsfeld in November of 2006 because the two were joined at the hip. You know, Rumsfeld's the guy who, for Ford, brought a 34-year-old Dick Cheney in to be Ford's chief of staff, unprecedented 34-year-old chief of staff for the president. Rumsfeld and Cheney, were they were bonded at the hip. I had one person tell me, you know, when you see those people, the body language, you don't know who's vice president and who's secretary of defense. And they ganged up on Powell from get-go 
Um, he didn't realize it. If, if he had a fault here, he, he thought he was a little more powerful in persuasion than he was. He used a metaphor one day with me coming back from a National Security Council meeting. He said, you know, Cheney knows how to get the president to pull his 45 out and start shooting, and I don't know how to get him to put it back in its holster. Um, and that was a good metaphor. That's what was happening. Cheney would get the last bite at the apple on everything. And so Cheney conveyed for his own reasons, I call them hyper-nationalism for Cheney rather than neoconservatism, but he conveyed the neoconservative mandate right into the Oval Office and made sure it was sacrosanct. And that in part was war with Iraq. They didn't want to stop with Iraq. They had a war plan for Syria and a war plan for Iran. And Israel was right there cheerleading them all the way. This book I was telling you about, Deadly Portrayal, is by a, a command chief master sergeant from the Air Force by the name of Dennis Fritz, who was in Feist's office after his retirement. Mossad owned that office for the period that they were working on the Iraq war. Douglas Fife was a card-carrying member of the Likud. Powell told George W. Bush that in his outcall on 11 January 2005. He told the president in the Oval Office, do you know you have a card-carrying member of the Likud party, the number three man in your defense department? President said, are you kidding me? I could find a card in his wallet. And Powell said, that's just a, you know, it's a metaphor. He's working for Israel. Donald Rumsfeld said, quote, I don't run this building. APAC does, unquote. A lot of forces were at work on this very inexperienced president. And he didn't figure it out for five years or so. And let's just segue to the situation in Ukraine, because I think in those pivotal moments in 1989, 90, 1991, between the demise of Gorbachev and the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, the neocons and that expansionistic, the same mentality that wanted Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, Syria, was also at play in uh, the United States, essentially using the collapse of the Soviet Union to take over all of each Eastern Europe. And that's what fundamentally has led to the conflict now uh, in Ukraine. So I would love to hear your, um, your sense of, I would say, the last 30 years of the neocon strategic formulation in Eastern Europe and how that shaped what's going on now uh, uh, in Ukraine because that mentality is still in the Oval Office yeah. and at the head of the State Department uh, and the Pentagon uh, to the present day. Yes. They have been superb entrepreneurs and opportunists, no question about it. Uh, as I indicated, they couldn't get anything really serious out of H.W. Bush. I, I, when I tell people how euphoric we were in 1992 about Russia would be a member of NATO eventually. We were destroying nuclear warheads. We were uh, inviting Russia for the third or fourth time, depending on your historian, to be a member, a real member of Europe. And not just from the Urals toward Europe, but the whole of Russia, all 148 million people, all 11 time zones. Um, and then along came Yeltsin, drunken Yeltsin, and Putin there watching. Um, and along came... Goldman Sachs and Larry Summers and Anatoly Chubias and others who ripped up the whole scene in Russia. Uh, they held a fire sale and got rich on fees. I think Larry Summers probably increased the endowment of Harvard by several billion dollars because uh, ripping off uh, the, the Soviets. And what they did in essence was they took all the communist assets, which were quite extensive industrially speaking, and they sold them at fire sale prices to the oligarchs who now own them. And they got the fees for it. Predatory capitalism in its very worst form at work on a former enemy turned peaceful for the moment. And they could take advantage of it. And they did. Um, that really caused some rancor amongst a lot of people, including Vladimir Putin. 
So it begins there. Then we go and bomb for 78 days with Bill Clinton, Russia's allies in Serbia. Not that Milosevic and his gang didn't deserve some bombing, but they didn't deserve 78 straight days. And, they, and Russia didn't deserve the sort of, go away, we don't need you anymore, we're going to bomb them anyway. Bill Clinton, looking at the second election, knowing full well that without Israel's help, he never would have beat H.W. Bush in the first place, Bill Clinton is looking at re-election being tough. He made a big mistake with don't ask, don't tell. That was his policy. Um, so what does he say? He says to himself, I need some bona fides in the national security arena. Here I owe, again, students for these vivid insights, students who beavered away in the archives, other places. Um, and he said, ah, who might be my opponent in my second time around? Oh, Colin Powell. Both parties were searching all across the country for support for Powell. Both parties made him an offer, um, almost like Eisenhower. Again, what do I mean almost? It was like Eisenhower. Again, there was a committee for Powell in every state in the union on both sides of the political coin. And that mm. was the real problem with the, with the advice he got. You can't get elected because of that, because you got both sides wanting you. So when you make a decision which side you're going to take, you're going to lose. Uh, it's not politically possible to win. There were other reasons too, personal reasons that he didn't run, but Bill Clinton was scared. So he said, I got to burnish my national security credentials because this guy has got them par excellence, Colin Powell. Let's expand NATO. Let's look like I know what I'm doing. And, <laughs> and oh, by the way, I got a lot of money from Lockheed Martin so they can sell F-16s to Poland. They're telling me their wine is going dormant because they're not making, okay, let's sell them to, oh, maybe Hungary too. And, you know, we're off to the races with NATO expansion. Look at what we've done. Albania. Look at a map sometimes as to where Albania is and where Montenegro is. Understand that Albania is a criminal state just like North Korea is, and that Montenegro is the automobile theft capital of the world. We made them Article 5 members of NATO. That means that farmer out there in Iowa is willing to risk nuclear war for the automobile theft capital of the world. That's what we've done. That's what Bill Clinton did. Bill Clinton and his wife did that. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of help, but you know, Americans don't understand. Both parties are oriented the same way. War, war, and more war. You know, the Dems may talk occasionally about let's attenuate it here. Let's not do that. Let's do yeah, what the Dems killed us when we got the Yemen war powers resolution passed through both houses. Pelosi knew she was trying to stop us from getting it out of the house, but she knew she was going to fail because the progressive caucus and others really got together and did what they should do. We got it passed in the house. It got over to the Senate. So she decides political astuteness, right? I'll get both sides to praise me. The Dems who do not want the Yemen war to continue with our support and those who are not wanting to get rid of Saudi Arabia as an ally. So I'll get them both. I'll vote for it in the House. It'll pass and then Trump will veto it. And that's exactly what happened. We passed it in both houses, but it got vetoed by Donald Trump. So she got both sides on her. Yeah. A, a, a duplicitous politician, if there ever was one, and knew every trick of the trade, really ran the House. You could hardly do anything in the House without having her imprimatur, which Rohana and others will tell you who were working on this legislation with us. So there's not much difference in either political party. Uh, the Dems may just look like they don't love war, but look at what Biden's been saying about mm. China. You talk about a disaster, a war with China. First thing that's going to happen is two U.S. aircraft carriers are going to be in Davy Jones' locker. They're going to be on the bottom of the South China Sea. 10,000 Americans did with one fell swoop. What do you think America's investment in a war with China will be then when we've taken such casualties? I guarantee you if we go to war with China, there'll be 100,000 casualties in the first 30 days. Well, let's talk about that just for a second. I, it seems from the outside, as Jody's been saying, preposterous that the United States would be taking on two superpowers simultaneously, uh, Russia through the Ukrainian proxy war 
and an escalation uh, with China with more and more rhetoric about the certainty of war in a few years. And, and in the Congress and in the administration, there doesn't seem to be anybody even talking about putting on the brakes. What's, what's going on in the Pentagon uh, that, that, that is there anybody questioning this momentum toward war? Because it's, it's, a, it's a suicidal move, not only for the United States, but potentially for humanity. There's a, there's a principle of international relations that we have neglected to the maximum. It's called conservation of enemies. And simply stated, it says, yeah, a prudent nation never courts more enemies than it can handle at one time. What you just described is insanity. And yet that's what we're practicing right now. Right. Now, as to your question <laughs> about the Pentagon, there are a few sane people left over there. I'm, I'm sorry to say not many, but there are a few and they're scared to death because they know what it would mean and what a farce the American military would look ultimately in this conflict for at least the first 30 to 45 days. And we're not about to mount offensive operations and put our army, which is smaller than the army of Bangladesh, in China. In Fujian province alone, it would disappear in a week. It'd be gone. It'd simply be gone. They would envelop it. The Chinese have more fishing boats that are armed than we have Navy. Then they have their Navy. If you've ever seen an array of their fishing boats, all of which are armed in the South China Sea, you know it goes from maybe the Paracels all the way to Haiphong. I mean, it's incredible how many ships they have. Now, I'm not saying that we couldn't have a, a decent war with them. We would. It'd be a, a stalemate after about 30 or 40 days. We would have shot down their air force. They would have shot down a good portion of ours. We will have attrited their Navy to the point where it becomes a fleet in being. It won't sally forth. It's in port only. And they will have done similar things to our Navy. And remember, our Navy is tiny. Think about the end of World War II, 7,000 some odd ships. Today, we are lucky if we can put 200 ships to sea. What do you do after that? Well, I'll tell you what you do, because I've done the war gaming. What you do after that is you stare at each other, mortally wounded in some ways, in terms of your military. And you say, what next, general? And they say, well, let's put a few tactical nuclear weapons on Shanghai. Maybe that'll convince them to stop. Well, what do you think they'll do back, says the civilian who's playing the president in the war game. Um, well, maybe shoot some nuclear weapons at us. Yeah, and where do you think they'll aim? Well, Los Angeles, New oh, stop the war game. We're not going any further here. Bill Perry played one of these war games, and I remember, I remember him. We're not going there, General. We're not going there. That's the only way you can impact one another once you have conventionally created a disaster. But then you come back to Clausewitz again, when he writes in book eight, I think it is, about the nature of war. Once you have that many dead Americans and that many dead Chinese, you're in for a penny, in for a pound. We see that phenomenon a bit in Ukraine. And then you turn to those mm. and you think, you know, oh, I can control this. I'll just shoot a few to make them know we're serious. You can't. Mm -mm. Once it starts, all of our escalation theory that we developed during the Cold War that now everyone's forgotten about demonstrates, I think, pretty conclusively that once you start, you're not going to stop. Ooh. Oh, my God. <laughs> so uh, this rhetoric about Taiwan and everything just it. And you saw the pictures yesterday, I guess I was watching on video of the committee in the Congress that's setting itself up as the prima donnas of war. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say, OK, first thing you should do is tell the American people there'll be a tax man on their front porch tomorrow morning for the first thousand dollars you're going to have to pay instantly. Be ready to write a check or use your credit card. Every single American will have to pay a thousand dollars off the bat and then we'll still be printing fake money. Yeah, but they don't even care that 65 percent of their tax dollars already goes to war. Mm -hmm. You're right. Yeah. That, so that's the most that's, disappointing thing. 
Yeah, that's, you know, very difficult because it's like you're going without and you're not even watching the country is it's, it's a post developed country. It's not even a developed country anymore. If you look at the numbers of, you know, the numbers are horrible and going down by the day. If you go to West so, Virginia or Southern Mississippi, you'll see it. Yeah, no, it's bad. So, um, but again, too many of the people with their levers on power don't have a clue what's actually happening in their own country. And so, or don't care. But, um, you know, Bill Perry um, and Jerry Brown talk every day and they get letter, you know, Bill Perry still writes passionate, passionate letters to Biden exactly with, you know, having gone through those experiences right. trying to pull him back on China. Um, but this week, Taiwan back channeled to uh, Biden's office, please stop the rhetoric about China bombing Taiwan. Yeah. Taiwan I, is I, China. China, if you don't understand a Chinese mind, because China is not going to bomb itself. And so, but what you're doing is creating the anxiety in this country that we can't have. Um, because, you know, the last woman, the woman president's lost because she let Nancy Pelosi come to Taiwan. And they said they're losing investments, that investments are leaving Taiwan right now. Yep. So the, then, you know, the, the price of this, you know, war on China already has casualties. It has Asian American casualties and it has casualties of, of, you know, profound anxiety raising in Taiwan that wasn't there before. The story, it's a story, no different than, you know, what we did around Iraq. It's a story. Um, and stories, you tell stories enough, they will push people into acting. Uh, of course, I think she's a more level-headed person than Putin to be pushed by the United States into, into action. But um, we're not thinking about, I mean, nobody, nobody is caring with power the people that are already bearing the pain of this war. Look, look at what we've done to Zelensky. I mean, we, we have not only made a, a, a sort of paper hero of him. Um, this is a man who was making money as a lots of money as a comic speaking fluent Russian on the stage in Moscow. And, you, and now now look at what we've done to him. And we've done it for Lockheed Martin and for Exxon Mobil and a host of other reasons. Your point about Taiwan is very spot on, though, because the Chinese do not want to ruin the economic relationship, especially the Fujian province, but China in general has with Taiwan, nor Taiwan want to ruin it with China. And look at what we're doing. We don't pay any attention to the people we are, quote, helping, unquote. We just bull ahead like a bull in a China shop. And that's what we're doing with Taiwan. And it's going to be the Taiwanese who pay the 23. Know that. Yeah. They say, don't Ukraine, Taiwan. Yep. Larry, just one final uh, question that I have, and that is about Joe Biden. You know, the point that you made about Bush Jr. was that he was so inexperienced and unsophisticated that he was easy prey. For the Dick Cheney's and and sort of the sophisticates of the uh, of the State Department and the and the Pentagon, but with Joe Biden, you have someone uh, who, in part because of his age, has had extensive experience uh, both domestically and internationally, uh, and yet he seems to be even more extreme than Bush Jr. How do you understand the? I would say almost like the mind of Joe Biden and the 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 uh, the alacrity with which he has been involved in the war in Ukraine and now in the build up to China uh because as president of the United States he's in a pivotal position to to either stop this or change it but he seems to be accelerating full speed ahead on both fronts how do you understand Biden and the general situation there in the White House and its state uh, at the moment. Yeah. Part of the problem is the people he's picked to advise him. 
Um, yeah. They're, they are all of the same cloth. Uh, part of the problem, too, is we have made, contrary to almost all of our founding fathers, one or two of them were of this mind in the beginning, the divine right of kings apply to our chief executive. Look at the brouhaha over trying Trump. That should be no brouhaha over that at all. You know, if the guy's a criminal, you put him in the courtroom and you try him and you put him in jail. Yeah, I don't care if he's in the United States. <laughs> and you tell his Secret Service detail, you know, which people are talking about as if that were sacrosanct, uh, wait outside the prison for 10 years or whatever. Um, this is bull what we've done. The presidency is an elixir now, and mm -hmm. it contaminates people. Instead of a person like George Washington who says, I don't want a third term. I'd set a terrible precedent. I don't want a third term. I don't want to be here another time. I can't set that president precedent uh you got people who say i want to be here another term and another term and another term oh i love these perks you have no idea how isolated i didn't and i still probably don't really but i have a better view of it the president is and how subject to his advisors he is and how much a creature he is of the captivity of those advisors and how little they get from anyone else in the world who might have a different opinion. It's all reinforce the message. Tell them again and again and again and again the same message. Tell them they won't get reelected if they retreat from this war too precipitously. Tell them that they won't hold NATO together if they don't do everything. they Tell them that the money won't pour in from Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Grumman, and all the rest of the bastards and the war merchants out there. And the, uh, suddenly they become believers. And, and it's all about our political system now. It's broken. It's badly broken. Hmm. Larry, and, thank you. And we don't have any we don't have any real character in it. We we simply don't. We've bred it out. The system has bred all the character out of these people. Yeah, I think that's that's we're governed by pygmies when we need giants. You got it. You got it. it we've never, never in our history, probably because of nuclear weapons and the climate crisis, needed giants more. Oh, absolutely. Larry, thank you. And thank you for being so clear and thank you for your courage and thank you for everything that you're doing to bring awareness uh, to the uh, the public about these crucial matters that are really determining the fate of the earth quite literally uh, we're we're in the balance right now and we need to make sure uh, that we're as informed as we can be and you've brought a lot of truth today so i just want to acknowledge you and and thank you uh, for that uh, very, very much. Very, very much. Thank and Jody, you. why don't you make a final oh, comment and then we'll I close out. I want to add to my gratitude. Thank you, Larry, so much. And, and I hope you understand how much everyone needs your clarity. Mm -hmm. And also, as you say, you're going off into the West to see that you're right, the fog of war is lifting and the crust of lie is ready to be cracked off. People are, are ready. And I think what we're going to see is the Republican Party is going to capitalize on this because um, the Democrats are too chicken. But um, the lie is crack is is an easy crack, as Medea can say as she's out on her book tour across the, her hundred city book tour across the country. Deepest gratitude. Thank you so much. You are peace. That is, you know, the truth will set us free um, and lead us to connecting to each other instead of separating. Well, thank you for all that you do. And Kelvin Dia, I said the same thing. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, everyone. That'll bring our session to a close for today as we conclude our program on Ukraine. This has been extraordinary, Jody. I, 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 uh, and, uh, and you've given a grand finale par excellence, my friend, uh, Larry. So thank you so much. Uh, you're all welcome to the after session chat. You'll see the link in the chat box and we'll see you again on Monday uh, for a uh, five day program on regenerative health. Thank you everyone, bye Thank for you. now, Thank have a good you. weekend.